Hi, welcome to the Bridge Connection. I'm really glad you're with me today. I am um, Chuck Woolley, one of the pastors at the Bridge in Cathedral City, California. Um, we started this uh, time in the Word at the beginning of the uh, pandemic that we have been confronted with over the last several months, just as a desire to make sure that we could just stay together in the Word and simply go through the Word simply. And um, several weeks ago, we We'd done some books in the Bible and several weeks ago we said, we're just going to go through the book of Psalms. So we started in Psalm 1. We've gone verse by verse through 57 Psalms. We're up to Psalm 58. And uh, hopefully I can make a commitment. We'll just see how it goes. And if anybody is still involved with us, I'd like to take it through Psalm 150. But we'll just let me know if you want to, want to keep going or not. But we'll, we'll see how that goes, okay? Um there was an English historian, he was a politician, he was a writer. Um, his name was Lord John Acton. And over a hundred years ago, he said this, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now we can look at our, our leaders in our country and countries all over the world. Uh, there are many leaders that are very fair, very honest, very honorable, uh, but also uh, corrupt officials can be found at every level of government uh, all over the face of the, of the earth. And this was so true of Israel during David's youth. Uh, Israel was led by a, by a king by the name of Saul. He was a rebellious, self-willed ruler. David became a victim of Saul's injustices after stepping up. It's very interesting to fight Goliath and nobody else would. This monstrous Philistine champion and then uh, after that, David was falsely accused of crimes against Israel by this jealous king and then set out to take his life. As a result, this young warrior was forced to flee his homeland. For a period of seven to 12 years, David was a fugitive, forced to continually maneuver to stay a step ahead of the this ruthless king and his entire army that was out to kill him. The men who supported David were also treated very unjustly. Uh, we understand that David most probably wrote Psalm 58 during his years as a fugitive from Saul. Uh, some commentators think he read or quoted the Psalm when he removed the unjust judges of Saul's corrupt administration. He would have done so upon ascending to the throne of Israel. It's an imprecatory psalm, we'll talk about that, with David praying for God's absolute judgment to fall on the evildoers. Like David, we all long for a perfect, righteous government. But you know what? Because of our sinful human nature, even our best efforts to govern justly fall short. Psalm 58 leaves us just kind of sighing for the future era when Jesus Christ will rule the earth in perfect righteousness. We've been talking about that at church on Sundays. Until the glorious day, until that glorious day when Jesus takes over, this psalm assures us uh, that we're, he's going to persecute all ungodly leaders and God will avenge their, their suffering and the oppressors of those who have been you know, destroyed or hurt by them. Uh, Davis uh, fearlessly confronted the ungodly leaders about their perversion of, of righteousness and uh, justice. He abruptly asked them if they spoke and just and, and ruled justly. Listen to these first two verses in Psalm 52. Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. To speak righteousness means to declare and uphold God's law. To judge uprightly means to be just and fair. Obviously, the implied answer to David's accusing question is, no, we don't do that. David forcefully stated that the officials' perverted judgments and wicked works were the point is poisonous fruit of their of their own hearts as a result violence just kind of filled the earth because they they didn't rule justly and in accordance with god's law 
And the hearts of the rulers were corrupted by their, their sinful nature. Verse three, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born speaking lies. The Bible tells us we're all born into sin. Every, every human being. He's saying that these men, just like everybody, were, 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 were sinners from the womb. Um, straying from righteousness as soon as they were born. You know this Psalm, Psalm 51, verse 5, read it later. Uh, lying came as naturally to them and it does to us until we're, we're regenerated and, and we ask God to lead us. Lying comes as naturally as breathing and, and they purposely deceive the people. Even worse, they twisted the laws of, of God to accommodate their sin and to accomplish their unrighteous purposes. You know, we're going to see here in a moment, verse 4, that David compared them to venomous snakes, spreading their deadly poison with every untruthful word they spoke and every unjust decision they would make. Verse 4, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops his ear. Uh, that deaf cobra stops his ear refers to their arrogant refusal to listen to correction or to receive counsel from anybody else. They had blocked their ears against all outside influences. Verse five, which will not heed the voice of charmers, charming ever so skillfully. So this just further expresses their self-willed defiance, specifically referring to their rejection of the Lord and his, in, as it, and, and his instructions. Government officials, in fact, any, any leaders, but government officials have solemn responsibility, holy duties delegated to them by God himself. Whether or not leaders know or acknowledge it, God requires much of those who occupy positions of leadership. But in every segment of society, injustices exist. Ungodly people lead cities, states, nations, businesses, schools, various organizations, and even churches. Just as David cried out against Israel's corrupt officials, so we should oppose evildoers whenever and wherever possible. But let me explain in a moment how we should do that. God has commanded us to resist wickedness and to do all we can to stop it. We need to stand against evil, absolutely. But listen how David did it. Verse six, break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. So, so David prayed and ask God to forcefully stop Israel's wicked leaders, to stop them from continuing their evil injustices, comparing them to vicious, bloodthirsty lions. He called on God to break their teeth, break their power to oppress and devour the people. Now, we, we need to pray against evil. We need to pray against deception. We need to pray against those things, but we're on, we're, we're, this was Old Testament. This is before grace. This is before, before Jesus died on the cross. And so we're not to pray in precatory Psalms. I've thought about it a lot. I've wanted to many, many times. I wanted, wanted to pray for people that are hurting other people and people that are causing other people to suffer in pain because of decisions they've made or attitudes they've, they've had or decisions or laws and you know, you want to pray, God, just break their teeth and hurt them. And, you know, that's not what we're supposed, we're supposed to pray. God, you, you need to stop them. This is wrong, of course. But Lord, in your grace, it will, you know, reveal to them your truth. Show them who you are. Let, let, even though I don't like what they're doing and I want them to stop and I'll tell them face to face what, what I think they're doing is wrong and what they're doing I think is wrong. And, and uh, I have no problem doing that. However, I, I want to pay, pray in grace. I want to have your mind in me, Jesus, though you were equal with God, thought it not something to hang on to or 
or, or just, you know, all the attributes that you had, but you emptied him, see yourself in, and took the form of man. And when you died on that cross and hung on that cross, you cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I, I want that same desire. I want to be angry about sin. I want to be upset about corruption. And I want to be on my knees praying and interceding for righteousness. And I want to you know, uh, help those who have been abused and hurt. Absolutely. I want to be a part of those who will restore those and comfort those. I want to be one part of those who will confront people that are that are evil. But I want to pray that God can use it with, with, with tempered with your love and your grace and your forgiveness. I want to learn how to forgive. I want to learn how to, you know, in, embrace your love and your grace and your mercy with those around me without violating you know, being upset and, and angry over things that are done in this world and the pain that has been inflicted on so many people. But I, I want to have your mind in me. I, I want to be, you know, praying grace and forgiveness, but also have an attitude that, that David had and, and you had Jesus when you were here and you, you confronted things. And I, I, want, I want that balance in my life, okay? Verse seven says, let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if it is cut in pieces. Waters that, that melt away, um, they flow waters away as which run continually. I'm referring to water that evaporates or is absorbed into the ground and then, and then disappears. In other words, David was asking God to remove the unjust rulers by causing them to vanish. He asked God to make their weapons useless, like arrows that have been cut in pieces, literally cut short, having their tips cut off, leaving them blunt. Using two additional graphic comparisons, David asked the Lord to make them like a, verse eight, a, a snail that melts away into slime. Verse eight, second part of verse eight says, as a stillborn and miscarried baby that never sees the sun. David knew that God would deal with Israel's unjust judges. Therefore, he expressed his confidence that God would carry out, you know, swift and absolute justice, completely sweeping them away. Verse nine, before your pots can feel the burning thorns, he shall take them away as with the whirlwind, as in his living and burning wrath. Before your pots can feel the thorns describes a, a cooking pot being carried away in a storm before the heat from the fire beneath it warms the pot. The Hebrew text is here unclear, so translations of some details of this verse vary among Bible versions. But the point of the verse is simply this. It's crystal clear. God will suddenly and thoroughly judge the corrupt officials. It's God's job. He will completely rob them of their power and influence. That's God's role. In many situations, people are powerless to fight the injustices they face in life. For instance, most employees need their jobs to survive, which means they have to be very careful about speaking out against any unfair treatment of work. When a legal resolution is available, the individuals usually cannot afford the costs involved. And many times the costs go far beyond the legal to the point that people fear speaking out at all. In many nations and societies, citizens do not have the freedom to oppose corrupt governments. Where they do, most people can do little to truly bring about change. When we are helpless to correct the wrongs we encounter, and we see that even in our own government, many times we have an alternative. We can pray. Scripture actually commands us to pray for those in authority. Like I said, our first prayer for corrupt officials should be for their salvation. Christ died for them. And it's God's will for them to repent and be saved. We should never forget how much God loves the oppressed and cares about them. We not only have a duty to intercede for the abused,
but we should also be compelled to call on God to deliver them and to remove the wicked rulers who mistreat them. But we should also pray for those wicked rulers. It's a tight line. I told you that. Prayer is powerful and effective. We must never underestimate its importance. We should persistently ask God to judge evildoers. But we must keep in mind that he will deal with them in his own time and own way. Of this we can be confident. But we, we, but we need to pray for his grace and his mercy. We need to pray for those who are being abused, absolutely, and be a part of their healing. But for the grace of God, there go I, there go you. We're saved by grace. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. We all need to remember that. Verses 10 and 11, the righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked so that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. So David was encouraging the righteous who were suffering at the hands of the wicked officials. He reminded them of the day of God's judgment. He promised that they will rejoice when the Lord avenges them of the corrupt crimes committed against them. <laughs> he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, verse 10. Compares the vindicated righteous to a victorious army walking through a battlefield after the war. As they march off, their feet become stained with the blood of their defeated foes. In addition, God will reward the righteous for their faithfulness and loyalty to his law. And all men will recognize it, verse 11. Hey, you know what? We're all going to encounter injustices in our lives. And we're going to witness or hear of people being persecuted. But we should never allow injustices to depress or defeat us. Instead, we should do everything we can to stand against evildoers. So that this whole study... Yet when all is said and done, we have to commit their judgment to the Lord. If we are faithful to him, he will vindicate us. He will one day cause us to stand in triumph. Therefore, we need to rest in the Lord, patiently waiting for that day when he will judge all ungodliness and unrighteousness in men. You know, he keeps records on everyone on his judgment day. He will do exactly what's right. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So there's the balance. We stand solidly for the good, for the right. We preach the truth. We we're all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that is eternal separation from God. But God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that I believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I think of Paul. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He held the, 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 the coats of, of those who were casting stones on Stephen until Stephen died. Paul was on a mission to arrest and see that Christians were, were killed or destroyed somehow. But God in his infinite grace reached down one day and redeemed that man. So nobody's beyond redemption. So we get angry, we get upset about injustices, we get upset about things in, in our own nation, but we need to be the men and women who know that one day, a new day is coming, when Jesus will be totally in charge. In the meantime, we need to pray for goodness and righteousness. We need to pray that God will do what is right. We need to pray to pray, protect those that are being abused in whatever nation that may be and trust that God is working in every situation. And 
every prayer that we pray must be engulfed in God's mercy and God's grace, asking for salvation of even the oppressors. Thank you, Jesus, for your truth. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. There are many today that are being oppressed and, and, and hurt and overwhelmed with pain physically, emotionally. Lord, just, you know, uh, we pray that they would be delivered from that. We pray that those who are, are, are causing the oppression, that would, they would be judged by you. We also pray that they would respond to your love and your mercy. There's only two ways any of us can go, Lord. It's the same for all of us. Accept your grace and your mercy and live eternally with you or reject your grace and mercy and receive the wrath of God. So we pray for all those. We pray for they would turn to you, Lord. And we come against all the hurt and the pain. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, see you tomorrow. We'll uh, start Psalm 59, okay? God bless you.